Welcome everybody. Uh, this morning we will be discussing with Robert Fitzgerald the Productivity Commission's report on the not-for-profit sector 10 years on. Can you believe it's 10 years on? First, let me acknowledge the traditional owners of the land, wherever this Zoom, Zoom cast may be uh, being received. But the Queensland University of Technology acknowledges the Turrbal and Yagra as the First Nation owners of the lands where QUT now stands. We pay our respects to the elders, laws, customs and creation spirits. We recognise that these lands have always been places of teaching, research and learning. QT acknowledges the important role of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people play within the QT community and of course all over Australia. It's my pleasure this morning to introduce uh, Robert Fitzgerald, uh, the Principal Commissioner in the Productivity Commission for the Productivity Commission's report on the contribution of the not-for-profit sector. And we've asked Robert to reflect on the report 10 years on from it being handed down and having such a um, profound um, impact with the creation of the ACNC, but what of the other recommendations? It is a large report, and I recommend that we should revisit it from time to time, together with the appendices, which have lots of great information, which are still very, very relevant to where we are today. So please, Robert, uh, help us to understand where we are 10 years on from your report. Good. Thanks very much, Miles. And I must say, it's a great pleasure to be as part of this forum. And I want to thank Wendy and the team at uh, the Australian Centre for Philanthropy and Not-for-Profit uh, Studies, uh, an association that's had an enormous influence on the well-being of the not-for-profit sector over such a long period of time. Let me also join in the um, um, acknowledgement of country. I'm on uh, in my office in Parramatta, the uh, land of the Barramatical people. And uh, they've been associated with the Parramatta River for over 60,000 years. So when we think about our concerns today, um, we can put that into some context. Uh, 60,000 years is an extraordinary uh, connectedness to the place and country we're on. In many senses, uh, the, it's the starting point for this report is to understand context. And in some ways, I want to start with the change of seasons as we move from spring to summer. And the question for me is whether or not we're at the dawn of a new decade, a new decade of reform, of reflection, and of impact. Indeed, are we at the beginning of what I call the summer of possibilities? When we look at the last decade, um, I think it's important to understand its context. But let's just go back a little bit further to understand that the Productivity Commission's report in 2010 had its genesis in 1995 with the Industry Commission's report into what was called community or social welfare organisations. And whilst it's true that that report didn't have a large number of recommendations taken up by the governments immediately, it certainly impacted on the conversation within the sector, within government, within researchers, um, and more generally. And it was the start of a journey that ultimately led to the 2010 report and to the changes that we've seen subsequent to that time. Um, it was a sustained effort that followed the 1995 report that actually got us to where we are today. The efforts of individuals like Mark Lyons and Elizabeth Cham, uh, Miles McGregor Lowndes himself, Susan Woodward, David Crosby and Ursula Stevens and other people that were well known in the sector during that period, a period of advocacy and agitation. It was also a period where organisations really came to the fore, Philanthropy Australia, ACOS, the Community Council, and um, not the National Roundtable of Not-for-Profit um, Organisations, and indeed university bodies such as QUT. All of that effort ultimately led to the 2010 report, 15 years on from the initial report. And during that time, there had been additional inquiries, including um, a strange inquiry in 2001 into the definition of charity. Ultimately, however, they shaped what was to come. And in 2010, when the then government asked the Productivity Commission to look at the not-for-profit sector, um, it was a time when really serious issues were confronting the not-for-profit sector. 
There were growing calls for greater accountability and a demonstration of impact. What was the real impact of not-for-profits, especially compared to both government and for-profit organisations? Uh, purchasing arrangements for services uh, were putting pressure on government and NFP relations. Indeed, there was a complete mismatch between the understandings of what the outcomes were expected from non-profits were compared to those expected by governments. There were workforce pressures across the sector, particularly in human services, and a changing environment for volunteers as more and more women were entering and remaining within the workforce. Uh, tax arrangements for philanthropy were, being, were outdated and, in fact, stifling the ability of uh, well-meaning corporations and high-wealth individuals from donating. And there were cross-jurisdictional differences which created unnecessary costs and inefficiency across the sector. So the 2000 report, where I was a commissioner together with Dennis Truen and Miles was a consultant on that report, uh, allowed us to really understand the nature and scope of the of the sector itself. Clearly one of the most important findings in relation to that sector was its size. And fortunately at that stage ABS were collecting data and it showed that the sector, the 59,000 economically significant uh, not-for-profits, which is only a small percentage of the total not-for-profits uh, that exist, were contributing $43 billion to the GPD of Australia. 8% of employment was in the not-for-profit space. Um, and indeed, volunteering, 4.6 million volunteers were contributing over uh, $15 billion worth of economic co contributions. And so those figures were large and significant. But the most important figure was that the sector was actually growing at a rate of around 7% per annum um, in the intervening period just before the 2010 report. And I think it really shaped the understanding of government and the community and the sector itself of its size, its significance, and its potential for impact. Most importantly, however, I think it also identified what the NFP sector really does contribute to the Australian community. NFPs were established for community purpose, and they were solely concentrated on achieving community good, and that community purpose really mattered. It was the thing that stood it apart from most other types of organisations. NFPs um, added value to the community through their activities and how they were undertaken, not just simply that they were providing services, but the way by which those services were being undertaken, um, being constructed, actually had a significant impact, especially in relation to the way it worked with consumers or clients or victims and survivors, depending on the nature of the services. Many of the activities that NFPs undertook were not activities that other organisations, particularly for-profit organisations, would in fact uh, ever be involved in. Um, and that's very significant when we look at the role of NFPs going forwards. And NFPs activities generate what we call externalities or spillovers, that is um, the impacts that it has on the community at large. Social inclusion, connectedness amongst citizens, enhancing societal trust, and frankly, enhancing civil society. And it articulated not only that these were the important impacts and outcomes of our NFPs, but also ways by which we could measure it. If we look at the core themes that were considered in that report, um, they are uh, well known. They were about knowledge systems that supported the understanding of the sector itself and created an environment in which there could be an, a greater understanding, a shared understanding between government and the sector at large. The need for clearer governance and accountability by not only charities, but also not-for-profits. And of course, that's uh, changes and is different according to the nature of the organisations. There was a need for a really strong sector development strategy to promote the support services for the sector itself. And that included improving governance and governance arrangements and training and support, uh, business planning and evaluation, most importantly, to actually deal with workforce issues, particularly workforce sustainability, and enhance access to new types of finance and capital investment. And there was a need for social innovation, new ways to tackle what we might call wicked or long-standing problems, including the way in which those sorts of uh, problems are funded. And finally, it was about changing and embracing a new relationship between the sector and individual organisations and governments, both state and territory, as well as the Commonwealth, and looking at different ways by which those funding arrangements could exist. And the report dealt with those. 
So those, those sort of headings guided the recommendations, and it's not my intention to go through the recommendations. Uh, Miles has previously indicated some of those areas, and you've already become familiar, no doubt, with the executive summary of the report. But again, just to summarise very briefly the headings that really were the centre, or, or, or I suppose centred the, rec the recommendations. The need for smarter regulation of the not-for-profit sector and particularly at the national level, at the Commonwealth level, the need to really establish a new national framework, particularly for charities, but for not-for-profits generally. Um, enhanced legal options for non-for-profit operations. We've had, you know, um, unincorporated associations and incorporated associations, but were there new models of um, ways by which we could establish um, legal entities to carry out not-for-profit endeavours? As I've indicated before, building a robust knowledge base, a knowledge system, that includes better evidence bases, better data on the sector itself. Um, the need to improve arrangements for effective sector development, particularly in relation to um, enhancing the way in which the sector can find financing and funding through philanthropic and other means. But it was also about addressing the workforce issues that I've referred to a couple of times now. How could we establish a robust workforce, given the enormous demands that would be placed on a need for that workforce, particularly in the human services area of ageing, healthcare and disability services? A real drive to drive social innovation, not only in terms of um, the way in which we fund the sector, including impact investing, but also in relation to the use of IT and technology generally. The sector was very, very backward in the use of technology, both in terms of its own administration, but also, and just as importantly, in relation to um, the way in which we deal with clients and consumers, and that really matters. And lastly, it was about a more effective way of funding by governments with the sector, particularly in relation to those issues that required a relationship-based model of funding. Sure, there was fee for service. Sure, there's funding in relation to, um, you know, what we might call transactional funding. There was the development of client-based um, funding where the clients had held the, the budget, if you want. But also there was a need to re-establish relationship-based models of funding with the government sector and a way by which we could come to a common agreement about the impacts. In other words, adding better value for every dollar that was spent by governments. And we proposed a number of ways by which that could be implemented. In many senses, there was many quick windfalls after the release of that report. And that came about because an engaged and committed government of the time, competent advisors such as Christian Seibert and Matt Tinkler and others, a united sector and a clear direction for reform. And those wins included the establishment of the Not-for-Profit Reform Council, an office for not-for-profit reform within the uh, Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet headed by Paul Ronalds, the ACNC, an enormous achievement led by Susan Pascoe, the statutory definition of charity was implemented, improved governance training, including by organisations such as the Australian Institute of Company Directors and many others, a movement to improve uh, standards of accounting and consistent national reporting, although that's a task still underway. Um, and indirectly, it enhanced the work of organisations such as the Centre for Social Impact. Um, it promoted the notion of social impact investing. There were significant changes in some states and uh, territories in relation to their funding arrangements with, um, with um, the sector. And that's persisted in a number of the jurisdictions, including Western Australia and New South Wales. But tragically, there was what I call the winter of discontent a change of government and especially a change of minister and advisers. And the summer of possibilities turned to a dark winter, a barren landscape for, to which policy and reform came to wither and die. And at the Commonwealth level, there was a retreat from not only reform by the Commonwealth, but a complete lack of enthusiasm to deal with other state, across other states and territories and to deal with very substantial cross-jurisdictional um, blockages and burdens. Thankfully, in more recent times, there has been a thawing of that icy landscape and perhaps the signs of a spring are re-emerging. And in recent times, I think there is cause for some optimism. But context absolutely matters. So just let's look at the last 10 years, the three things that I think have been most significant. 
The first has been the increasing marketization of human services. Um, and many not-for-profits now play within various markets, particularly in disability, aging, health services, early childhood development, and supported job, job markets. We've also seen in that particular marketization significant flaws and failings in those markets with a lack of uh, you know, acceptance of the severity of some of those um, impediments. The second is we've seen a number of royal commissions that directly impact on not-for-profits in relation to child sexual abuse and responses of institutions, the aging and the disability royal commissions. But also I think the banking royal commission has had a significant impact. And I think there's two or three themes in those royal commissions. First was the operation of markets and how they have strengths and weaknesses, but the ever-present need to be constantly monitoring and evaluating. The second was the chronic failures in corporate governance within institutions and organisations. And thirdly, the absolute significant problems being experienced within workforces, particularly in relation to ageing and disability areas. And these workforce issues will only get worse, not better. The third one, of course, has been COVID in the recent year. And here I think there have been a demonstration of many failures and weaknesses in our service delivery system. On the other hand, however, there's been three very positive things come out of the COVID experience. The first is that humanity really does matter. The well-being of individuals, the dignity of humans has been really at the centre of many discussions. And particularly for people with disabilities and other vulnerabilities and frailties, their rights have been at the centre of many discussions. The second is that citizenship matters. We haven't been talking about consumers, consumers of this service or that service. We finally recognise once again what we should have always treasured and, uh, as something very precious. And that is governments have an absolute role in ensuring the well-being and welfare of its citizens broadly defined. And we now know that that matters. And we do expect governments to deliver. And we do expect governments to, in fact, contribute positively to our well-being. And the last, the thing that's dear to the not-for-profit sector is that community matters. And why should, it, we should, why should we have ever thought that it didn't? Suddenly, community initiatives by neighbourhoods, by community organisations, by local government have been at the heart of our response to those most vulnerable in our community. Can we as a sector now, in fact, use those in a way to reshape the agenda going forward, reshape the conversation with government, reshape the conversation and the relationships we have with philanthropists? I hope we can. These issues, humanity and citizenship and community, are at the very heart of why not-for-profits um, exist. It's the very reason we are different from for-profits and for government. So if there is to be a summer of possibilities, what are some of the undone, uh, unfinished business? Um, and I won't go into that, but only just to repeat some of the important things that I think continue to be outstanding. Rebuilding the knowledge base. It is critical that we once again establish a firm data and information base with ABS data being collected. It simply is unacceptable that the sector does not have robust data on a national level to inform it. We do need to reconsider whether there does need to be a centre of excellence, service excellence, that can look at and promote evaluation and research about the performance of the not-for-profit sector. We do need to ensure that we support good quality research, and I'm absolutely delighted that under the leadership of Elizabeth Cham, the ANZ, uh, the Australian and New Zealand Third Sector Research Initiative, um, has come back to life. We do need better regulation. We need to protect and improve the ACNC and extend its remit to that which was always envisaged, that is, not-for-profit organisations, not only charities. We do need to deal with fundraising. And whilst there are recent reform initiatives being announced, um, it has been a sorry tale of poor political commitment and frankly bureaucratic uh, incompetence that has led us to 10 years of waiting for significant reform in this area. We do need to fix the DGR status and extend it so that it's a much more powerful instrument and a much more targeted instrument for doing good in our community sector. We do need to continue to pursue sector development in a number of areas. We need to press forward in relation to workforce development across a number of the human service industries um, 
particularly ageing and disability. We do need to embrace technological reform and, and change, both in terms of our organisational uh, use of technology, but as I've indicated previously, very importantly, how do we use technology to empower people, vulnerable people, particularly those living in their own homes and often isolated? And we absolutely need to continue to pursue innovation in, in financing. At the moment, I will look forward to the, the task force's report in relation to social impact investing that the Commonwealth Government has established. But that's only one of many approaches that can be taken to innovative financing. And absolutely, we need to continuously reform and reflect on the governance arrangements within the sector. Many of the governance models being promoted at the moment are too static. They are not relational enough and frankly are not necessarily fully suitable for organisations that are dealing with vulnerable people. And the Royal Commissions have demonstrated that, and the Child Sexual Abuse Royal Commission in relation to institutions clearly demonstrated that governance models need to take account of the very people they seek to serve and work with. And finally, government relations are continuously an area of ongoing um, dialogue, um, and frankly, reflection and reform going forward. We need to ensure that the value for money concept which dominates government um, acquittal arrangements actually understands the external benefits that come from non-for-profits. Those spillover effects that I talked about of social cohesion, social trust, enhancing civil society, they matter. And in the contracting with governments, they should be part of the discussion and they should be part of the funding agreements. We absolutely need to see a renewed reform drive at the Commonwealth level, and hopefully um, the re-establishment of a not-for-profit reform or renewal council, whatever title it might hold, so that there can be a nationally consistent approach to renewal and reform. So with all that, the last 10 years has been a time of change, of great hope, of many positive initiatives, and also of great disappointment and great frustration. But the challenge is not looking back, it's looking at going forward. And I believe that post this uh, most difficult of years, the NFP sector is in an extraordinary position to enhance its impact in the community. Um, but it will require a good and uh, robust relationship with governments, philanthropists, the community at large, and frankly, a willingness to work together as a sector. So let's embrace a new summer of possibilities. Uh, let's look forward to a, a decade in which the reforms of the 2010 Productivity Commission report can be fully realised, and more importantly than that, that the sector does even greater good for the community um, and receives the recognition that it so rightfully deserves. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you, Robert, for those uh, reflections on the last 10 years. But particularly, thank you for the challenges that you've presented uh, all of us uh, today. And uh, I look forward to seeing what the next 10 years holds uh, for the sector. So thank you, uh, Robert, and thank you all. This is the end of this Zoomcast.